I'm Martin Bauer. I worked on Blake 7, Doctor Who, Tripods, Captain Zep Space Detective. Does anybody remember Captain Zep Space Detective? Yeah. Good grief! Yeah, the f it's the first convention I've been to where I've mentioned it, because usually you get total silence and everybody goes, what? <laughs> <laughs> you, remember, you mentioned the kids with the slick back hair and then sort of a few recognitions come, but basically nobody's ever heard of it. Um, I'd like to tell you first of all that um, in the auction, which is later on I think today, um, two items from Captain Z Space Detective and also a gun which was used in Doctor Who, Blake 7, this thing here, will be auctioned off for the charity auction. So if anybody's interested, there's that and two items that are there as well. Um, I actually worked on Blake 7 first of all. Um, as a subcontractor. Uh, I never actually worked at uh, BBC Vision and Special Effects. Um, I was based in Bracknell in Berkshire, and I used to make all the props and design an awful lot of the props as well, because some of you may or may not know that despite what it says in all the books, it's actually me that designed the teleport bracelets. Um, Ian Schoons, who I worked with, um, did a wonderful drawing of an elliptical bracelet. Unfortunately, because the show had a very limited budget, and also very, very limited time, um, it wasn't possible to use his design. And as again, I've said, some of you might have read this in uh, Horizon magazine, but uh, in fact, the teleport bracelets came about by me having what was left in my box of goodies. I'm afraid it's a very, uh, uh, it's not, not quite the sort of, uh, something is stealing the show here. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the, the um, the bracelets came about by uh, simply a process of what I had in my box and what I was able to cobble together in a few moments to produce one particular bracelet. Um, I kept the thing fairly simple, which I was very, very pleased about because, of course, when I went to the studios and showed Ian Schoons, he said, right, he said, I want 50 of them, <laughs> all the same. <laughs> and they're actually made out of basically plastic tubing, as I'm sure you know, and pieces of perspex, pieces of pretty coloured perspex, which I simply happened to have in the box, and a little button made from a, a little plastic ordinary plastic button. Um, I'm afraid there were no more, uh, there was no more thought behind them really than that. Um, it seems really strange that something that I created like that out of a few minutes and rummaging around in a box has actually passed into science fiction history. <laughs> but <laughs> I'm afraid that's what it was. And also indeed the uh, piece of Christmas chrome decoration tape simply happened to be a Christmas chrome decoration tape and I just put it on and it looked nice and Scoon said, great, make them, I want 50 of them. And that's how the design was born. Um, Ian did an awful lot of drawings, which may or may not be in the portfolio that Sheila's got. I'm not sure, because I haven't seen the portfolio. But an awful lot of the designs were done by myself. I've got some uh, photographs of them. Regrettably, an awful lot of what I did was never photographed. Um, and indeed, I have to say that I actually don't remember a lot of the things that I did. I've got photographs, as you'll see, of some of the stuff that I did, but an awful lot of it I haven't, I'm afraid, got reference of them. But I do have the original drawings for the guns, for the trooper's guns, um, which I built, uh, for the teleport braces, which I built, and for various other bits and pieces. Um, however, I shall start by, I don't need to introduce this thing here. Um, I know many of you hold this in, with, with great reverence. If you actually worked on the show, you curse this thing all the time, because I'm sure I don't need to tell you that these things here, which are piano wire, ping, um, are very, very dangerous. And while we were filming this thing, this thing was held most of the time, almost all the time. It was photographed on a black pole. We've got a silver pole here, but that was replaced by a black pole covered in black velvet. The thing was lit, and the camera tracked past it, which was how the Liberator was made to move. Um, I subsequently built two other smaller models because this thing was so heavy and so difficult to work with. But while we were filming the thing, we used to put pieces of masking tape on the end of the, on the, end of the probe. Scoonzy would say, everybody calls him Scoonzy. He's not Ian, he's, he's Scoonzy. And he would say, put something on the end of these things so that nobody pokes their eye out. We would do this, we would be halfway, sh halfway through shooting a shot, and he'd say, stop, stop, take the bloody flags off. <laughs> and, there would be, and hence, all the outtakes, and very many of the, uh, the, the rushes would actually have at the beginning, shots of the Liberator flying beautifully through space with these beautiful little flags on. <laughs> and it, it was actually often shot like that because we would just forget to take these damn things off. Luckily, nobody never, ever did impale their eyeballs on it, but I think that's more out of luck because it's very, very sharp. Um, the other thing that you may or may not know is that um, 
I actually came onto Blake 7 in a very kind of sort of a progression of things. I wasn't actually approached and said, would you like to work on the show? I was working at Brave Studios back in about 1978, I think, um, on a commercial for Jif Dessert Toppings. <laughs> the Earth is being invaded by gooey desserts, launch new Jif, it said. And I had to make a flying saucer and giant Jif fruits, which laser beamed the bowls of ice cream. The, the, the flying saucers were bowls of ice cream. And I was working on this, and Ian Schoons just walked into the studio carrying this model, or at least part of this model, because about, two, about three quarters of this model is only original. The rest of it is, has been rebuilt. Um, and it's also extensively been refurbished, as I'll show you in a moment on the slides. Um, but Ian walked in carrying this thing, and basically it was a white spacecraft. There was no detail on it at all, and there was a green ball on the end. And he walked in, and I said, why is the cockpit green? Uh, to which Ian said, uh, no, that's not the cockpit. Uh, that's the back, that's the engine. This is the front. <laughs> and I mean, I must admit, I wasn't the first. It's easy for you all, of course, now you know it like it is, and we all know it goes this way. Although which way you move in space is irrelevant anyway. <laughs> but um, I said the obvious thing. And also, the model looked as if a man in scale to it would be about this sort of height, instead of about this sort of height. So Ian said to me, what can you do with this thing? You've got like three or four days to make this thing look really big. So I spent that time drawing all the little panel lines on it, putting all the little bits and pieces over it, putting the writing on it here. This wasn't on any of the original drawings. This writing was done by myself. And it was done because I'd worked on Space 1999, another television series which doesn't have anything like the following of Blake. That's another story entirely. But uh, a series which had a huge budget, but has uh, not got anything like the power of Blake 7. Um, and I'd actually produced this sort of alien writing, and I simply had used that on a model in that show, and I transferred it onto the Liberator. Um, and again, the, cats, the same thing where the solar panels on here are again Christmas chrome decoration tape. Space 1999, if you do know it, was very famous for blowing up the models. We actually never blew up any model at all. We blew up photographs of the models, or else we made <laughs> dummy models which we would break up and photograph. Unfortunately, with the Liberator, for some inexplicable reason, and I believe it was Matt Irving, I'm not sure, or, or either, either him or Jim Francis, when they did the breakup sequence of the Liberator, they took a hacksaw to this model. There are, Jim. sorry? It was, it was Jim Francis. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Uh, um, there are two steel rods down these things here. These are actually solid wood, these engines. There are two steel rods running down inside these pylons, which are made of wood, and into the model. This means that these things are very, very heavy, balanced on a very small pylon, and they would gradually break loose inside. To do the breakup shot, they took a hacksaw to this thing and they sawed the engines off it, and subsequently covered it in glass fiber gunge like brown gunge, and as you know, blew the thing up and had it all spinning away in bits. So they actually destroyed the model, or semi-destroyed it, and it's quite a job to bring it back to its original state. However, I shall now move it out of the way and show you some slides. Whereas it first came to Brave Studios, you can see how it's got the green ball at the back. Um, this is a younger version of me working on it. Um, I'm sort of part way into it, but you can see I'm sort of putting shaded panels on it and drawing on it. This is a BBC publicity photograph taken at Bros Studios. But as you can see, it's just got a plain green ball on the back, very little else. Right. And there, it is a few hours later, and I've not even been home to have a shave. Um, and it was finally detailed, as you can see it there, which of course is how it was finally filmed. And you can see, of course, the little the flags I was referring to stuck on the end of the probe so that I didn't poke my eyes out while I was working on it. This is it, again, um, this is actually in my home. This, is, uh, this was taken when one of, the, one of the many, many extra green balls had been added. I took it home because they said, oh, we've melted it again. Can we have it back in the studio on Monday? Um, I might point out, now it's, it's hard to, I can't remember how much it cost to have the green ball remolded because they're fact formed in green perspex. But when I came to rebuild the destroyed Liberator, as you now see it, each of those 8-inch diameter hemispheres was £58 plus that to have made. And that's now. Then I, I remember them being very expensive then as well. Um, you can see how the, the model is supported in the same way it is now. It's got a little metal rod going up inside, which is clamped in a vice. And this is how the model is usually filmed. And that's what it looked like after the episode where they blew it up. Um, you can see the there, that's where the light bulb went. That's an ordinary domestic light bulb fitting there. And you can see, of course, the melted ball on the end there. But uh, the model that you see in front of you here is this bit here. This piece and this piece were rebuilt. 
And the model there is, is this bit which you see here, plus the probe on the end. These probes, all three of the probes are original. Close up of it, you can sort of see the kind of damage it had to it. I, I really find it difficult to understand um, what quite why the gunge on it was put on with something which was unremovable. Um, in order to get this cleaned off, I had to rub the model right back down to its basic wood. Um, all that stuff that's all over it is glass fibre resin mixed with brown paint. Those are the probes on the front of the Liberator. They're brass. This model, as I said, was made by Space Models. Very, very strong model, actually. But uh, those, those are the three probes in their original brass state. And behind it, you can see the nose section here, which has all been cleaned off and rubbed right back down to its original. This is during 1992, I think, I did the main restoration to it. Um, you can see it's not quite finished yet, but it gives you a rough idea. And of course, I was using my original photographs. There, you can see the photograph I've just shown you pinned on the wall as reference to get it correct. The model originally, when it came from Space Models, cost £3,000, by the way, in case you're interested. A remarkable amount of money even then, but Space Models are a very expensive company. They're very good. They do a lot of film stuff, but they are very, very expensive. Um, what the model is actually worth is open to well, guesswork, really. I mean, it's very difficult to value a thing like this now. Uh, this is the, one of the smaller liberators. These were 20 inches long. It's about two-thirds the size of the one that's on the stage. I did two of these. They were built much, much lighter out of plastic tubing and uh, turned on a lathe. And the, the model is, as I say, it's, it's about sort of that kind of length. Serverland ship. We've actually got it on the stage here. This was thrown in a skip. Anybody wants to know what happens to some models when they're finished with? It's true, they did it with Virgil Tracy, they did it with uh, the Serverland ship. This was thrown in the skip when it was finished with. It's perfectly, it was absolutely immaculate after filming, unlike the Liberator. It was absolutely perfect, and it was thrown into a skip at visual effects. It was retrieved by Matt Irvin and subsequently given to me, and you probably know it was auctioned in the charity auction a year or so back. Um, this was when it was actually being built. The model is very, very heavy, very, very strong. Again, it can be supported on these rods and it's made of wood and perspex. And you can see that um, with model making, reference photographs are very, very important. And as you can see on the wall in the background, there's, there's all my... There's <laughs> all my reference shots. Yeah, well, you, know, you need a bit of inspiration when you're working, don't you? <laughs> the same model in different stages. On the left, it's finished, but it's not painted. It's just in grey primer on the right. It's shown with all its panel lines drawn on, and, and of course the very, very important weathering or dirtying down process, which makes the thing look like it's more realistic. And this is the key to making a model look as if it's used, and it's because it's got to be dirty. Because everything in real life, if a real spaceship had re-entered the Earth at, uh, atmosphere and what have you, it would be burnt and streaked as you see it there. And we found a lampshade, a centre of a lampshade, which looked just like a generator tower, which had been drawn by the art department. We went to Woolworths and we bought this lampshade, turned it into this generator model, and the guy said, great, brilliant. He said, right, we need them all over it. They're absolutely wonderful. Do you think we could find another one of those bloody lampshades? <laughs> we did eventually, but we had to scour the south of England, found them in Woolworths in, in uh, Staines in the end. But <laughs> I'll teach us to cut corners. That was originally Travis's gun. It actually it says that there. Um, I don't have a photograph of the gun. I only ever made one of these. Um, at the time. I've made some since recently for various people who might be here. I don't know people I've made this for. Um, but this was the little pistol that Travis used, a small handgun, based on the same design sort of format as the other one. This is the gun that killed them, I'm afraid. Um, it's a beautiful functional um, model. I say I didn't build it, my colleague and friend built it. But this was actually the gun that did the damage. And it, was a, it actually converted from a pistol into a rifle, and you could clip bits and pieces all over it. But it was finally the gun that, that killed them. Does anybody know what this is? Yeah, it's... Thank you, yes. Doing your homework. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there's nothing new now. I've blown it now, you see. Yeah, this is the original design for tripods. I worked with a guy called uh, Steve Druitt on tripods on the very first original show. And he asked me to produce... my mic still on? Um, he asked me to produce a design, and I came up with this. Subsequently, the BBC realised, as they often do with these things, that I was an outside contractor, and that if I built it, uh, there would be copyright problems and design problems. So they en ended up going, of course, with the design that we all know and love. 
that's another shot. I did a lot of uh, publicity photographs of this design, as you can see there. Um, unfortunately, the, the slide was lent to the BBC, and that, you can see how it came back. Um, a bit sad, really, because it's the original slide. It's the only one I have. I quite liked it. I thought it was quite a nice design itself. I, th I thought it was pretty menacing. But they actually based the tripod design on the hermit crab. It's the shell of the hermit crab is what it, where the design came from. And this is the, uh, the largest of the models that I built for it. This was six feet high and about six feet across as well. And it was worked on screen by three technicians holding the legs and just moving them. Um, the rest of the leg wasn't there. Um, in the first episode, you see, it was actually filmed at Friday Street near Leaf Hill in Surrey. This is, a, this is a little village where there are no roads. You go there and you have to walk to it through the trees. A lovely little place. This is where the first episode of Tripods was filmed, where they did the capping ceremony. And uh, the, the tripod legs were built full size and were standing in a lake there with all the scaffold pole actually under the water. You had divers there putting these scaffold poles into the water. Um, built loads of scales of these things. But I built lots of these, lots and lots of these things. I even built little squatting versions which skimmed across the water. And, uh, in one particular episode, close up of the middle sized model. This, is, this was the model that was used, um, this was the prototype that was actually built uh, for the show. This was actually built at the BBC Visual Effects Department by them. Um, but this is the cyberscope. Um, for some reason, uh, the design was done by um, a BBC effects director. I'm not sure which one, I really can't remember now. But uh, it's very strange because it, I wonder why they made it this shape because it just looked immediately like the TARDIS. And yet the Cybermen are supposed to be a totally different race. And yet they wanted this thing to look like the TARDIS, which I didn't understand. This is a typical shot in my workshop. You can, <laughs> it says it all, really. I mean, there's the cyberscope there. There's a cyber bomb, a, cy a Cybermen's guns here, um, the cyber bomb there, the cyber lance there, cyber gun at the back there. Uh, you can see, and this was the sort of stuff I would just be churning this stuff out week after week as fast as possible. The, the time scale for producing this stuff was very, very fast indeed. Very, very short uh, amount of time given to me. That's the cyberscope finished. It all fully functioned as well. These displays, these LED displays, which actually worked, there's one here, are out the Nostromo. They are the same ones which you see at the beginning of Alien. They were thrown away when we finished Alien, big bonfire, Everything being chucked, all those lovely space helmets, fiberglass space helmets, all the electronics, boxes on, chucked on a bonfire. And I managed to re grab a bit, so did lots of other people. And uh, I used them on the side scope, and they were all beautiful little working LEDs. And if you look at Earthshock, you'll see coming up on the LED display are the same sequence of numbers that come up in the Nostromo's cockpit. The time scale was ludicrous on Alien. We would have to build things really, really quickly.